Okay, welcome into what I'm calling Reflections from Pharmacy Leaders Advancing the Profession. It's my pleasure to have with us this morning uh, Adam Persky, Dr. Persky, who is a clinical professor of pharmacy at the University of North Carolina and a fellow in CIPER, which stands for the Center for Innovation in Pharmacy Education and Research. Uh, Dr. Persky's background is in exercise science, uh, but he has a postdoc and a PhD in pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. Uh, he's been recognized as an American Association of Colleges of Pharmacy Distinguished Teaching Scholar. Uh, he's also one of the associate editors of the American Journal of Pharmacy Education and has been very prolific uh, in educational research, uh, but also has written a book on the foundations of pharmacokinetics. And with that, I welcome Adam. So thank you. So what I want to start off with is um, have you, uh, we would like to learn more about your journey uh, and, and your development as your, your position and your career and, and, and your journey and recognition as a leader, an academic leader. And in that, uh, you may wish to um, sort of highlight key events or key people that impacted or influenced you in this journey. Sure. So I've never intended to be here. Um, I started as a double major in biology and chemistry at Purdue. Um, I love biology, but I know chemists got jobs. And probably after taking organic chemistry and inorganic chemistry, I realized chemistry was not for me. Um, so I stuck with biology and I was an ecology major within especially of biology and discovered one, I don't like camping. So ecology was probably not the best fit for me, but I really liked animal physiology. And then I took human physiology and really loved the physiology. First time I really had questions about the discipline. And I played sports for a good chunk of my life, played soccer, hurt myself a lot playing soccer. So sports medicine was of interest to me. So talking to a few people, I learned about exercise science and really interested in muscle physiology because you hurt muscle, muscle gets bigger and stronger, hurt the brain, not necessarily the same effect. So I applied to exercise science programs to study muscle physiology, um, and I got two offers to go to grad school, one from University of Massachusetts Amherst um, and one to Penn State. Uh, both were closer to home. I went to Penn State to interview. It was a PhD in physiology. Um, I came back and I said, I want to go to Penn State. And Penn State says, that's great, but you'd have to pay for yourself because we have no stipends for you. And I said, I'm not going to pay for a graduate school career. So I went to University of Massachusetts for a master's in exercise science, which was one of those fortuitous things that led me down this path. Um, at Massachusetts, I worked for Priscilla Clarkson, who I did not know was a very big name in muscle physiology. Uh, she eventually became the president of the American College of Sports Medicine. A uh, great mentor taught me about how to present, how to be a professional. Um, my two years there, I learned a lot, you know, surrounded by people that were amateur athletes, amateur bodybuilders, Olympic athletes. Uh, and my knowledge of physiology grew. And so did my interest in pharmacology, because if you knew how the body works, then how drugs manipulate the body just made much more sense. And around the time was when the Dietary Supplement Health Education Act came out. So dietary supplements and athletes was very popular as well. And my interest really was, well, can I go to a pharmacy program to learn about drug development and apply those standards to dietary supplements, how we prove those are safe and efficacious? Along the lines there, I was also funded as a TA. And I was the shy, introverted kid that didn't want to say anything, didn't want to be in front of the classroom. And I was asked to be a teaching assistant. And I was like, You're, I know nothing about exercise, I know nothing about nutrition. I'm actually pretty dumb. So you probably don't want me as a TA. And she's like, no, you'll be fine. You know, more than freshmen and sophomores. So I was terrified to teach. Um, but I also love talking about what I like talking about, which is the exercise science part. And my competitive side wanted my students to be better than the rest of the TA students. So my little section of students got extra help sessions. They got all this other practice because I wanted them to do really well. I got into a 
I went to a conference to kind of figure out my pathway of how to get a pharmacy. And I talked to someone named Toby Tate, who was the then president of the American College of Sports Medicine, who was faculty um, at University of Houston, who said, well, you should work for my friend, Gail Brazil. Um, Gail was a faculty member at Houston who moved to the University of Florida. She's like, Gail studies muscle physiology in terms of drug damage. You study muscle physiology in terms of exercise. You'd be a great fit. I emailed Gail at Florida and said, hey, I know Toby, I know Priscilla, I'm interested in pharmacy, she said, come here. So I moved down to the University of Florida to a PhD in pharmaceutical sciences. Um, and Gail, being the mentor that she was, um, was happy to take me in and she knew my interest in education and she really helped me put words to things that like, here's what I like for teaching. She's like, oh, that's called active learning. I'm like, oh, there's names for these things. And really the first person to kind of get me into, there's a science behind learning. Um, and then I took things like pharmacokinetics, which it was math, it was hard. I saw how it was for the students, it was a PharmD course. I took the PhD level course and I'm like, I'm gonna fail out because I don't know calculus that well. And I felt really stupid. Uh, but I liked it because it was physiology with a math spin on it. And then I took it as a challenge. If I can understand this, I feel like I proved something to myself. And when I became a TA, I think like I wanted to teach kinetics because I saw how hard it was for the students to learn. So I got into kinetics because it was hard for me. It was hard for the students. So I thought if I could teach it and learn it, then I'd be good at it. And I did my dissertation on creatine, uh, a dietary supplement used to enhance muscle mass for athletes, but also lots of clinical applications. And Gail left for uh, Buffalo halfway through my PhD to become associate dean there. I finished my PhD at Florida and was pretty sure I'm not going to academic because I really loved the teaching part more than the research part. And I seemed to have some natural talents there. The students really loved what I did in the classroom. Um, so I learned about the postdoctoral program at UNC. We spent one year in industry and one year at, at UNC Chapel Hill in pharmacokinetics. A lot of PhDs go to industry, so I didn't want to rule it out. I came here, worked with some great kineticists, and Kim Brower and Gary Pollack, who were great mentors. And they said, you know, we know you're interested in faculty. We'll give you all the things you want to do. I got to teach in the clinical kinetics class. I got to write grants. I got to do everything that a faculty member could be doing as a postdoc. And I started to look for jobs after my postdoc. Small schools of pharmacy were teaching center because that's where I thought the teaching jobs were. And one day I came in and Gary and Kim said, well, Gary's becoming the executive dean of UNC. Kim Brown's coming to the department chair. They're like, we need someone to teach kinetics here. Are you interested? I'm like, well, of course, I was interested because in, I've been to big institutions, Purdue, Florida, UMass. Um, and they said, it's a one-year contract. If you do a good job, you get a second-year contract. You'll teach kinetics and do whatever you want with teaching. And that's how I got my job. And I was given carte blanche access. Like, we have large classes. We have these satellite campuses. You see how far you can push the envelope as far as teaching. So that's how I got my pathway um, a lot of fortuitous things about getting rejected from Penn State, having some really great mentors who prepared me for things, um, and turning down two job offers in anticipation of them creating a job for me, which was, my parents didn't understand that, but I was like, well, better me stay here with a job that I really, really want versus selling for a job, which may not have been ideal for me. So it, it took a risk. It worked out. Um, but I also had confidence in the people that was that was helping me out. So that's how I got here some 15, 16 years ago. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so the other question I ask is um, looking at your legacy, and let's say you're fairly young, so 20, 30 years. <laughs> uh, and um, so, and I rephrase this question by asking, um, looking at your, what are you most proud of in terms of your contributions to help advance the profession of pharmacy? Um, so I think my greatest contributions on, let's say, 
start at the school level with UNC Chapel Hill School of Pharmacy was really the first person to really do active learning in a large classroom, to start doing educational research, which opened the doors for lots of other people to try things, to hire people who are educationally trained to help advance the mission. Again, being self-trained is great, but having formal training probably a little bit easier. Um, and I think I've helped that both at the school level and the university level, that I got involved with the university and helped people who taught Psych 101, Bio 101, Chem 101 to really take a more scholarly approach to their teaching. And now they are doing great things. They're being interviewed for the Chronicles of Higher Education about diversity and inclusion. Because uh, I was part of a faculty learning community about how to teach large classes. So I think I've had an impact um, to help move the dial for education, both at the school and the university. Um, nationally, uh, I think some of my contributions may come from trying to bring that evidence to the larger audience, to saying there is a science to teaching. Um, it's not just teaching the way you were taught. Um, and I think I, I like to think that I, I've helped move that dial a little bit. Um, and maybe from the educational research perspective to kind of bring in cognitive psychology. You know, I have a psych minor from my undergrad days. And it was a real interest to me, like how the brain works and then really how to justify active learning. Because for me, I was always taught, if you understand the basics, applying it really is helpful. So if I understand how the brain works and how we learn, the designing classroom stuff, helping students learn makes much more sense. It's not just techniques, it is the science applied. Um, so I think those have been my contributions. And really the most important thing is kind of seeing the success of people. You know, my students who graduate and do great things and years later will, you know, say nice things about their time here to the faculty that um, maybe I get a chance to mentor here and there because um, I me mean, mentoring was a big part of what got me here. And sometimes I think I'm a terrible mentor because I'm not maybe as uh, involved as I think I could be. And I'm a PhD and, you know, students are looking for pharmacists for, for role models and mentors. But I think for junior faculty, for, for students, you know, even my PhD training and how to write a CV and how to present, how to become a better student and being professional, I think have all been helpful. So I've not always done the right thing, but hopefully I've done things right. Um, that I've done the right things when needed to, um, versus being perfect in everything I've done because it's impossible for me to be perfect in everything. But hopefully the legacy is the people that say, hey, you know, he was a pretty good guy and did what he thought was the right thing to do. Excellent. Excellent. Great. I appreciate that. Thank you. So uh, next question I have is advice for students in their professional journey, especially as we're trying to develop them as leader, leader the little owl, change agents to influence and advance the profession. So the leadership part's an interesting part because I never thought of myself as a leader. I never ran for any positions in high school or undergrad or masters. I did my own thing. I did what I thought was right. I did what I was passionate about. And one day, Phi Lambda Sigma, so the Pharmacy Leadership Society, inducted me. And I'm like, I don't know why you're inducting me because I am not a leader. I mean, I'm just, I just do my job. And the students read speeches about why you got inducted. And they said, you're a passion about student learning. Um, you stand up for the students. You try to advance us so we have a better educational experience. And that's what makes you a leader. And that's when I kind of learned about little L and big L, that it was, it was not necessarily the title that you have. It's the way you behaved and the way you acted. Um, so my advice is, you know, one, I think everybody's career path is not straightforward. Um, things happen at the time you think they're awful, but you are meant to be where you are. Um, and things that happen to you may suck at the time, but looking back, it's like it was meant to be. I was meant to go to UMass and interact with Princess Hilda Clarkson. I was meant to give up my formal research in pharmacokinetics and dynamics or exercise science and pursue education. Um, so one part is, Career paths are, are, are messy, but it's messy for everybody. Um, 
the best piece of advice I got early faculty when I was a postdoc, I talked to Bill Campbell, who was the dean at the time at UNC. And Bill said, you should never feel lucky with ever, whatever job you get, because once you feel lucky, you stop trying to change status quo. Mm -hmm. So I took that to heart of, you know, even though you're at a great place and feel lucky you have a job, you can't play it safe. And you always have to do things that you think are the right thing to do. Um, and as a junior faculty member, when you're, you know, for me, you're enthusiastic, you're passionate, you get beat up a lot because there is the political side of things, which I'm not very good at navigating. And you try to change things and, you know, you get knocked down. And it really, I think it's about getting up more times you get knocked down, that you pick yourself up. It gets easier over time, um, but you you have a goal and the goal ultimately finds a way of, of happening. So I think it's messy. It's, you know, I watch students get knocked around who want certain things and it's just part of the process and it's hard, but you just gotta pick yourself up. Occasionally it's harder. Um, and once you get to a part where you're viewed as a leader, it is, you know, I think paying it forward. I mean, when I got to full professor, I was told that it's about giving back. It's about helping junior faculty. It's about helping the institution, the school. It's not about me anymore. It's about what I can do for other people. And I've always kind of had that mindset, but that has kind of brought it home of, you know, it's, it's not about you. It's about how you treat other people and how, what you can do for them. So I think that's the biggest part of leadership is being transparent, uh, acting in a way that's in line with your ideals. Um, and, you know, try to see the bigger picture and understanding that not everyone would be happy, but as long as people understand the choices, things tend to be understood by the people that are following you and you have to learn how to follow. Absolutely. Team player. Absolutely. Well, that's, that's great advice. Thank you for that. Thank you. Now, um, what I'm doing is uh, developing a history and pharmacy leadership course, and this mm -hmm. is part of it, and I'll explain it more after we're done recording, but um, as we study the decade of the 2020s, one of the key events in this decade will be COVID-19 pandemic. Yep. And like other things in history, as we study our history of our profession, there have been key events that's happened in the world that has shaped our profession. So as we look at the decade of the 2020s, I believe we will say this was a key turning point for our profession. Um, and uh, as an optimist, obviously, uh, it creates opportunities for the profession. But maybe uh, comment about your insights, how you see this as a turning point for the profession of pharmacy. Yeah, it's, it's weird how history cycles, you know, 100 years ago, we had the Spanish flu. Um, and now 100 years later, here we are. And I think the there could be some really good things that come out of this for pharmacy. From a pharmacy practice perspective, you know, I think I've learned over time that data doesn't change minds. You can have all the research in the world saying, here's the value of a pharmacist in a clinical practice. But until people see it and experience it, um, that's what's going to change people's minds. And I think this pandemic has shown that, that pharmacy stepping up of, they're in the front lines. They are, you know, doing things because physicians and nurses are now overwhelmed with their jobs. So they're going to have to rely on pharmacy more just because there's just this huge healthcare need. Um, you know, when you read stories about tents being set up for emergency departments or uh, funeral homes importing, you know, storage for the deceased because they're overwhelmed, it's it's this huge healthcare problem. Um, and I think it's a great opportunity for pharmacy to say, here's what Oh, I just lost your sound here. Hello. No sound. Can you hear me? Uh oh. All right. Well, I believe we have lost Adam here for a sec. Hopefully, we'll get back connected here. Hello. All right. Well, let me go ahead and stop the recording.
Okay, we're back. Uh, so to continue, <laughs> talking about the effects of COVID-19 pandemic on the profession. Okay, so yeah, so I'm not sure where I lost you, but I think, you know, the from the practice side, I think the, the value of pharmacy being shown um, that the nurses, the physicians get to see this thing, you know, my wife who is a family medicine pharmacist who also has a supplemental job as an inpatient pharmacist. Um, and just hearing the stories of how all the walls have come down amongst the disciplines that nurses are so thankful for the pharmacists and, and are rightfully saying this in, in practice and pharmacists and physicians as well. So I think that the common goal of helping in this pandemic has lowered those walls where people might have been very protective of their of their borders um so i think that's that's one of the big things that's come out of this is hopefully the pharmacists have shown their value on a large scale despite all the data about the value of pharmacists um and i think that's the thing that's going to really help change practice um from an educational standpoint i mean i think we're getting used to uh, distance education. Um, I don't think it'll completely change the way schools are run because we still need face-to-face -face stuff. I think there's a lot of value to face-to-face -face instruction, especially when we get to OSCEs and simulations. Um, but I think, you know, telehealth would extend from practice, which is now, yes, we can do it, but now we really need to do it to how do we go and institutionalize it to the educational practices. Um, and I think people have are really starting to value other people because um, people are dying to go back to work, which is probably not something you'd ever think would happen because they're they're missing that social engagement, which is part big part of human. You know, we are we are social beings, um, and just I think having gotten married during COVID um, and having to cancel a wedding, reschedule another wedding, and try to do the best, just people really stepping up and you know doing bending over backwards to help you out to accommodate you to give up their time and i mean the photographer we're supposed to get married in savannah georgia and the photographer says well i'll come up and do your face-to-face -face wedding in september um or a place is saying we'll give your money back because it's not fair and these are small businesses that probably need our money um so i think really we we saw the really good in people um from all this, our neighbors who threw a party for us in the in the street, um, social distance, of course. You know, everybody sat in their driveways and had their bottle of wine or champagne, but it's something we never really thought would happen. Um, so I think the profession's gonna gain something from this, but I think hopefully people in general will gain things from this about what it really takes to be a neighbor and a and a good person and and really step up when times are needed. Very good. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. And congratulations. Thank you.